Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. My name is Adi and today I have another Series 12 team report and I am joined by another top player. I have Nick Borgie. Nick, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How about yourself, man? I'm, I'm doing great. And uh, do you, for everyone who doesn't know you, do you want to tell everyone a little bit about yourself? Uh, yeah, sure. So I started playing Pokemon back in like 2009. I was on like the PO ladder doing singles and then... I went to my first event back in 2012. It was Philly Regionals. Uh, I was pretty bad as a senior, but I went. I started going, taking events seriously post Worlds 14. Um, I ended up cutting Philly Regionals as a first year master. Since then, I've cut uh, four regionals. Now I have a couple of other accomplishments. I won my first big tournament uh, over a year ago. Now that was the Rose Tower LCQ. Um, otherwise, I've just been around for. A really long time now apparently um yeah that's that's 10 years of vgc that's a that's a crazy amount of time yeah it, it's been a while now apparently I, I would i didn't even realize until i was talking with gavin he said dude you're old <laughs> yeah uh yeah. I, I mean it I, I i feel that i've been i started playing singles as well in 2009 and it's just been thinking about it that's like over half my life at this point um and i'm 25 so like yeah that it it is kind of crazy. Although I started VGC a lot more recently than you, um, and so I guess do you want to talk about the team that you use? Because you used uh, Beriscuta, definitely the uh, the flavor of the week during the the IC. Um, so why did you choose to build around Beriscuta, and how did you approach team building with this team? Okay, so the, this story entirely starts with a team that my friend Yuki sent me, and it had Seismitoad. And my biggest problem when I saw the team was that Seismitoad hit a speed stat of 138 at max. And immediately I decided to tweet out. <laughs> I immediately tweet that out. And there's a whole bunch of people that come into my mentions. It's just like bad take, bro, bad take. I think Sohib was the most notable one. Um, I saw that. <laughs> yeah, so I'm sorry, bro, with bad take. <laughs> um, and so I, I saw the bat tweet, and my immediate response was like, Sun don't shit. It's not better than Landers. <laughs> um, but that got me thinking eventually, like, Seismitoad is not good. How does Rain build balance? So I spent a lot of time building Rain balance. Station Ogre was my favorite archetype for a while. And then NPA comes around. I'm on the Samurai's. And Domarp comes in chat and he's like, did Beriscuta do something recently? And we we're like, no, why? And he said, I've now played two on ladder today because he's been in like the 1700s for a little bit now. And the team was Poggies. He said uh, he said he played uh, a player named Poggy. I recognize the name, don't know too much about the person. But the team that they stole, uh, that they stole was... Uh, Calyrex Ice Rider, Kyogre, Beriscuta, Incineroar, Sableye, and Mimikyu. And as soon as we saw that, a bunch of us, like, our minds started going to work, like, does, okay, this is obviously bad, but does Beriscuta have anything there? Because we started thinking, Swift Swim and Seismitoad. Is, is there a better way that we could do something like that? And so the initial thought was, well, Bear Scoot is really fast, and it has Swift Swim. Does it get Airstream? It does. And then we were like, that pairs super well with Scarf Kyogre. Because a lot of teams' lazy answers to Kyogre or Torn Ogre in general has been focused Ashaleki because it's just so good. It, they, we set tail, you set Tailwind as the Torn Ogre player. They live the Water Spout with Focus Sash, Electroweb you, and it's a pretty hard game from there. But Beriscuta with Max Airstream next to Timid Scarf Kyogre, you can actually just Airstream and Water Spout turn one to remove the Leckies. And so that's where the concept started. We're like, this can do something that Seismitoad really wishes it could do. And from there, we went through a couple of different versions. We built this like really balancey version. It had Incin and Amoongus over the Rillaboom and Ndidi. And we kept refining it a little bit. And we decided eventually that Rillaboom, it, the team has to have a grass type because 
obviously, if you're relying super hard on Barrascuta Kyogre, you're going to end up having problems with the Gastron. You can play around it a little bit with Thunders having Airstream or play rough from Zation, but you're, you're at the end of the day, you're really going to need that grass type. And for me, that was Rillaboom that I thought was really good because it pairs super well with Zation. Um, another Japanese player in the IC used Ferrothorn. I didn't think that was too good. And then Marco obviously used Kartana, which I'm not the biggest fan of, but we'll get into that later. And from there, we were like, well, indeed, he's really good here because it allows us to change terrain in front of Rillaboom, and we can then bounce, or max airstream, rather, to remove Rillaboom. So you could lead something like Barrascuta plus Kyogre, and immediately you can switch out the Kyogre into Ndidi if you want, so that way they lose terrain, they can no longer grassy glide you, and you can just one-hit KO them with a max airstream. And from there, we kind of started refining a little bit more. We realized these five that we have lose super hard to Trick Room. And in general, there weren't going to be very many ways to deal with it. But we wanted the Ndidi because in, uh, we wanted the Ndidi and Rillaboom together because they could actually do something really interesting into a lot of these Mimikyu teams that you see running around in the IC, where if you lead uh, fast Ndidi, timid Ndidi plus Rillaboom, into, say, Incineroar Mimikyu, you can immediately go for Helping Hand Max Drum Solo to one-hit KO the Mimikyu through the Intimidate and through the Disguise. And that just immediately can set us up for a great position. That ended up happening in one game during the IC, but I still thought it was a beautiful concept to have. Uh, so, that like you said, you brought this team to the IC um, after you know refining it for a little bit, and you finished uh, at number 163 in the world with a final rating of 1810, which is just really, really impressive. Um, and obviously, this was definitely the call for the IC. As you mentioned, Marco Fiero also used this and got first place. Mm -hmm. So do you want to talk a little bit about how your team differs from his and maybe some of the strengths and weaknesses of the, uh, the different choices that you guys made? So one of the biggest things between our two teams is we, we have four of the same Pokemon. Um, one of them is only one of our Pokemon is legitimately the exact same being Kyogre. The everything else has slight changes to it between our two. Uh, Marco decided to run a Jolly Max station. I think that's very fair. I chose to run a slower version because I wanted that extra oomph for the IC. I felt as if um, a lot of, the standardization being 156 adamant right now, I felt like if I was, I felt like if I had significantly more power, I could get the jump on a lot of people who are EVing for around that range, the 156. So I ended up running like 236 adamantization just because I had the EVs to do it. Um, the, the next biggest thing is probably the grass types. Marco wanted Cartana and I very much wanted Rillaboom. I talked with him briefly about the differences. And Kartana, I think, is very good. However, my biggest problem is that it really doesn't mesh with the Zacian very well, in my opinion. Because when you think about it, let's say you're running into a Zacian, Eveltal, Rillaboom, Incineroar, Gastrodon, Aleki team. That's one that I played during the IC myself. That's a matchup that you can't really bring Barrascuta into. Um, and if you're not being able to bring Barrascuta, you can obviously still bring the Kyogre. But so if we take a look at Kartana, Zacian, Whimsicott, and Didi, that's really rough into Incineroar. And mm -hmm. so my thought was if there are going to be these super bulky teams that I'm not going to be able to bring Barrascuta into, especially with Storm Drain as an option, I wanted something like Thunderous that could one still deter Intimidates but could also continue to keep the pressure that Barrascuta was intended to do. And so that's where you end up with the two main differences. Marco chose Whimsicott over... So you could say the Kartana and Whimsicott slots are mixed together with the Rillaboom and Thunderous. Mm -hmm. Because they both slots are kind of interchangeable with a bunch of different stuff. Um, I feel like that's more of a preference, but obviously Marco did very well with them, I 
I think I think his build is very good. I think another one of the very big differences between our two teams was the focus sash on Ndidi versus uh, Psychic Seed. Now, Marco had a Whimsicott, which is very obviously going to want the focus sash. There's a couple of other items you can run. It's an IC. You can maybe even get away with like some trick eject button stuff, but that's whatever. Um, I felt like focus sash was actually an amazing item on Ndidi. Because Indeed is very good at these ICs at stopping a lot of the random stuff that you'll see, random quick attack stations, random uh, super powerful Pokemon that are trying to knock you out on switch ins. And Focus Sash and Didi actually allowed me to stall out Trick Room when I failed to prevent it very well. It allowed me to switch in and then proceed to follow me on the following turn so that way i could protect my barrascuta in front of stuff like a lecky or rillaboom and i i felt that focus ash was very good although we did consider other items like psychic seed and safety goggles we eventually decided on this indeed because of the mimikyu game plan uh where obviously once again you would leave the rillaboom plus indeed so i think that that was the biggest thing that I noticed. It's the choice in the Ndidi items. Um, another Japanese player that I played who had a very similar team, they were safety goggles, and another one was eject button, which was kind of weird. Uh, yeah, so that makes that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I mean, obviously, uh, Barrascuta is still like a relatively new innovation into the metagame, and so I think that you know we're going to see people continue to try this out and find new innovations and. These are still pretty basic teams, pretty straightforward teams, and as the metagame adapts, you're going to have to maybe tailor it more to the adaptations for this new variant of the counterplay to this new variant of Zacian Kyogre. So mm -hmm. uh, definitely worth trying out both versions and, and seeing how they both play. But uh, with regards to your team, do you want to talk me through some of the specific move sets and EV spreads and why you chose the moves and EVs that you did? Okay, so. Uh, I can just go from top to bottom uh, with Zacian. So as I said earlier, because I had the, uh, the I have double airstream as well as uh, a bunch of different ways to augment my damage output as well as augment the turn order, I felt like I could run a bit of a slower, stronger Zacian. So Adamant 236 does a ton of damage against everything. Uh, most a lot of these frailerizations don't live adamant behemoth blade. Uh, like Marcos does not live an adamant behemoth blade. And so I felt like even though I'm on the slower end, I still do a ton of damage. The EV spread uh, defensively is meant to live adamant max attackizations behemoth blade hundred percent of the time. And then I have 12 special defense just because of um, download. Just that way, I always, uh, Porygon 2 always gets an attack boost in front of me. That never came up, but it's something that I've been very uh, accustomed to over the past couple of formats. The biggest thing that I would say is a mistake is that the Zacian actually hits a 185 speed stat. And the problem with that is that at plus one speed, it speed ties Regieleki. Um, it hits 277 and a half, which truncates to 277. So if I could make one change to the Zacian off the bat, I would knock it down to 228 Adamant and bump it up to 148 speed just so I get that speed calc. Luckily, that never came into play in the IC, but it's something that very easily could have. So that, that's an immediate regret that I had when I was looking over the team the other day and I was like, oh, wow. Yeah, not my best work on that. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Kyogre is very standard. Uh, the biggest thing that I think... Uh, some players may miss is that timid is extremely important on scarf kyogre because while you may like the damage output of modest you need timid in order to outspeed uh max speed zation and max speed caloric shadow if you go modest you cap out at like 142 and you need a speed set of 149 in order to outspeed caloric shadow so you do get a little bit of a damage reduction as opposed to modest, but timid is extremely important for those situations. Uh, the Barrascuta, I have to say, um, 
I if I could go back and change the spread, I would just run four HP max attack max speed. The idea was that uh, Barrascuta only uh, it's so fast naturally. It has one thirty six speed. It has one thirty six attack. So the thought process is that you only need 188 speed investment to hit a 180 speed stat, which outspeeds opposing Thunderous. However, um, I did run into another Bear Skeeter where I ended up being slower. And if I had not crit the Giga, the max strike <laughs> turn one, it would have been a very poor position for me. Um, the defense investment is meant to be able to live a assault vest max attack Rillaboom's grassy glide while dynamaxed. And while I think that's really cool in theory, it never came up and I never gave it the position to come up because I would usually be switching into Indeedy anyway and air streaming it. So I would say just running four HP max attack, max speed is going to be more optimal than this slightly complicated spread. And how often did you find Beeruscuta outside of rain? Was that a pretty common occurrence for you? Uh, it wasn't super common. It was it, it was pretty uh, often that I was in rain, but every now and again, there would be those situations. And outside of that one game where the opposing Beeruscuta did outspeed me, it never became a problem, per se. But it was something that I think is just optimal to run max speed. Um, the really cool thing is that Adamant, Max Attack, Life Orb, uh, Max Geyser, one hit KOs, Max HP, four defense station. And that's with like two, three percent to spare even. And so that's actually where I get into Giga Impact. Because originally I had Quake on Barrascuta for Zation until I actually check the damage calcs and I realize Quake only KOs the bulkless stations, whereas Max Geyser just one shots them all in rain. You have to be insanely bulky to live that. And even then it's usually going to be a roll. So with that decision of I don't need Max Quake for Zation, Kunal actually brought up the game plan of Max Strike. Because there were situations, and he brought up one that actually did come up in the IC, where I can lead Barrascuta Kyogre into Rillaboom or any fake out in general, plus Regilecki. And I can switch out my Kyogre for uh, Indeedy turn one, and then max strike the Aleki. I will usually lose my Barrascuta turn one, but I've now striked the Aleki and Broken Sash. And I can get back in my Kyogre. So while I do give up my max word, I give up my max for an amazing position. And so that that actually did happen, I believe, just once in the IC. But it was it, it did win me the game immediately. So, but the biggest argument for Quake is that this team is insanely weak to Dialga. And Quake is just a way to deal damage to it. And it doesn't really do a good amount. It does like 50-ish percent in max. But they're going to one-hit KO you back with a max roar of time. And it's it's not the best way, but it is a way to help, I guess. So I understand the option of having Quake. But I felt like Giga Impact was just a lot better. Because one, it's significantly stronger than Bounce. So if I need a little bit of extra oomph... Instead of going for airstream, I can go for bounce. Uh, sorry, Giga Impact. Um, and I get a little bit more damage than airstream would give me. And so I, I absolutely love Barrascuta. I it came to out of my thirty games, it came to twenty two of them. And out of those remaining uh, eight games, Thunderous came to the others. And I guess, uh, do you have any questions on Barrascuta? No, I mean, it seems pretty straightforward. Uh, the one thing that I had seen was people running a lot slower Bear Scuda because you don't actually need that much speed when you have Swift Swim. Mm -hmm. uh, but if Bear Scuda becomes common as it is starting to do, then you kind of do need to run max speed adamant, like you said, just to win those speed ties because that's starting to, to pick up in popularity. Yeah. Oh, I, I forgot about something pretty big. Um the the next major thing that Barrascuta has over something like Seismitoad or other over other Swift Swim Airstreamers like Kingdra is 
uh, max darkness. It gets throat mm-hmm. shock, which is insanely potent next to Scarf Kyogre. And that's about 90% of the other Trick Room matchups where you can lead um, where you can lead Barrasquito plus Kyogre, click max darkness from Water Spout. And like this ha- this came up in the IC, they lead uh, Indeedee Dusclops and they're not Sash and Didi, you can click Darkness into either one and Water Spout, turn one. And if they're not Focus Sash and Didi, they get blown away by Darkness, and then Water Spout will KO the Dusclops, unless they're like max HP, max special defense, sassy. Or if they choose to, say, Expanding Force for some reason, or Protect, you double it into the Clops, and you can remove it immediately on turn one. And I had I had that come up once, where the Didi follow me it wasn't focused. Sash got removed, and then I removed the dust clops as well with water spell. And yeah, so, that's like a really potent, just like really oppressive thing that everyone has to account for every single lead, regardless of whether you click it or not. And it just gives you another really powerful option they have to respect. Exactly. Um. So yeah, that I think that's all I could really say about Barrascuta. It does a ton of damage and it's super fast. Um. Mo- moving on to Thunderous, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I really like Thunderous because it gives you those options into those bulkier teams that you can't really bring Barrascuta against, mainly the ones with a lot of Rillaboom hate and with a Gastron. The Thunderous is nothing insane. It's standard Assault Vest, helps with opposing Kyogre if you have to bring it. Uh, Jolly Max Speed hits a 179 stat. Nothing too insane. Uh, mm-hmm. The move choices of uh, Wild Charge and Fly are the two mandatory ones on Assault Vest uh, Thunderous. Uh, Brick Break was an option that I wanted over Superpower because I felt like Brick Break could be good for uh, the early game, against, especially against a lot of these bulkier teams where they decide to bring Grim Snarl. And I don't have to lead, uh, sorry, I don't have to max my Thunderous turn one. Because you don't have to max Thunderous turn one. That's something a lot of players seem to forget. Just because you're bringing the Thunderous, you don't have to go straight on the damage uh, warpath. You can you can stall a couple turns, brick break, lower their defenses a tiny bit, break through them a bit, and then choose to max, assuming you're given the options to. Right. So many people lead very passively into Thunderous, and if they're not pressuring it at all, then why would you you know, uh, blow your Dynamax so early. Exactly. Uh, foul play is probably a move that I think is a lot better in theory than it is in practice. Um, foul play in theory helps a lot against like Solaleos or it's something hit Zation if you don't want to take recoil. But the thing is, a lot of times, especially against stuff like Gastron or Groudon, you, being locked into fla- foul play isn't really the best because the Groudon's not going to sword stance on you because they realize that foul play is a pretty common option. And foul play does no damage to Gastron. Same with Brick Break. And then Fly is very easy to work around for them with Protects. And so I think Lash Out or Crunch is probably a better option in general than foul play. But that's just my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, the spread... This was a spread that I had been using for a couple of weeks at this point. Uh, I brought it to my NPA set. I brought it to a couple of USPA matches. Uh, it was just one that I was very comfortable with, although the EV spread doesn't necessarily work for this team specifically. Uh, it was just one that I knew a lot of the internal damage calcs for. What it's specifically designed to do is it lives in, it lives uh, two neutral Zacian Behemoth Blades, and... Obviously, without a Intimidate on this team or Max Wormwind, <laughs> that's not something that's going to be coming up. So I feel like th- this one was definitely more of a comfort pick just because I was very well accustomed to the damage calcs from it. But other people may want to use something slightly different, which I think is very fair. Mm-hmm. Um, going into Rillaboom... Uh, this was, once again, another spread that I made a couple weeks ago, and I've been using it whenever I want Miracle Seed Rillaboom. Uh, it doesn't do anything too insane. It lives uh, Adamant 156 Sations Behemoth Blade with that HP and defense, and it's also optimized for Grassy Terrain Recovery. 
Uh, the speed stat hits 117, which outspeeds zero speed Mimikyu. It speed ties four speed Mimikyu, but it outspeeds the zero ones. Um, so if they're max HP, max defense, four special defense, you will outspeed them and knock them out before they move, say if they will a wisp. Um, I feel like that's a fine speed stat to hit because a lot of them are slower. They're not usually running impish. They're usually running something like relax, I find. And then the attack is really just, I went up to a jump point. I made it pretty strong. I wanted to get the highest jump point I can while still preserving my other calcs. And that happened to be 196. And did you feel like you needed all the four moves or did you ever consider something like knockoff or high horse power? So I definitely feel like Woodhammer was the least used move. Um, I've never, uh, I haven't used high horsepower or knockoff in this format personally yet, but it's something that I am intending on trying. This was more, th once again, this was taken from a different team where Woodhammer was uh, very important for specific calcs and specific matchups. So I definitely think high horsepower or knockoff could be used here. Uh, high horsepower could maybe even help a bit more versus uh, Dialga matchups. Um, I feel like if you wanted to take the team for a spin, that's definitely something that you can try out, and it's something I would encourage. Uh, because usually you're clicking Grassy Glide 90% of the time if you're clicking an offensive move. Woodhammer is really there for some oomph, and you don't always need oomph. Uh, the last thing is the Indeedy. We originally had uh, safety goggles with near max HP and max defense because that would allow you to live a adamant Zacian uh, behemoth blade. And once again, we were going over the theory and we we're like, well, if we have a slow Indeedy and we lead it plus Rillaboom into instant Mimikyu, we actually don't get grassy train up. And without Grassy Train, you can no longer get that Helping Hand minus one drum solo KO on the Mimikyu. So we immediately decided to switch to Timid because we didn't. We figured for the matchup, for that specific matchup, we didn't need bulk whatsoever. And if we're not going with bulk, Focus Sash is going to be the best option. Now, I honestly felt like Focus Sash was the unspoken MVP of this tournament on Indeedee. Because it came into play so much. It was honestly one of the best options I could have had. Because I would say almost every single game I brought in DD2, Focus Sash would activate and it would be game changing. I played a single Amoongus all tournament and I was able to one hit KO at turn one with a max airstream and an expanding force. And then I played one Venusaur and they had their own trick room up. My Indeedee was out on the field and I expanding force KO'd them before they could move because they had their own sun up. Um, yeah, I, honestly, I think this Indeedee's great. It's nothing insane. It's literally probably the second most standard Indeedee you could find behind the max HP, max defense, psychic seed one. Like I know that's what uh, Marco had. He didn't quite have max HP, but he had something very similar. Yeah, that's a really good overview of the individual Pokemon. Do you want to talk me through how you approach some of the common matchups that you expected? A bunch of the matchups really came down to one, am I able to bring the Barrascuta? Because that was the idea behind the team. I was enjoying Barrascuta and testing. That was the whole draw to it. So the first question I would ask myself every time I entered preview was, can I and can I bring the Barrascuta? And usually the answer tended to be yes. You can bring Barrascuta against a lot of these hyper offensive teams that you see in the IC. Uh, the the Calyrex plus Aleki plus Zacian mat, uh, games, you can very easily lead Barrascuta Kyogre and remove both Pokemon turn one, depending on uh, obviously what they lead. Versus Sun, that gets a little bit tricky depending on their six. If they have, uh, let's say it's the um, NJ11 North team, it's really hard to bring Barrascuta into that because obviously they have their own Sun. They have Focus Sash, Calyrex Shadow. They have Gastron. Uh, 
that tends to be super hard. So you usually have to go with a thunderous mode in that. And thunderous and DD tends to be super good because you can redirect the Willowus away from thunderous turn one. And their thunderous tends to not be very good because of your own and It the biggest problem that I would say you could run into th with this team is Dialga, because the best way that you can really hit Dialga with this current paste is Sacred Sword from Zacian. And even then, they have a very easy way to mitigate your damage, be it through um, screens, which some of them had, or uh, just clicking Max Wormwind into the Ndidi, probably that's next to my Zacian. Um, two of my three losses, actually, throughout the IC were to Dialga teams. Um, then against other standard rain stuff you can really just go barrascuta plus kyogre have like rillaboom and then your choice of zation or uh indeedy and back depending on how good your zation is in the matchup um rillaboom against those seismitoad plus kyogre teams is almost a mandatory lead because it immediately puts pressure on them especially in a format like the ic where they feel like they can where they feel like they want to go straight for damage Versus a lot of the Palkia teams. Palkia tends to be uh, a little bit rough because of the Amoongus next to it, but that's where Play Rough comes in really handy. You can remove the Amoongus pretty fast. You can end game the Palkia with your own Zacian uh, because Play Rough does like 90% to Palkia in Dynamax. And it can even one shot sometimes if they're like 4 HP. Um. And then if they don't have Trick Room, it becomes even easier. The The hardest Palkia to face is one with Trick Room for this team. Because you can't go the usual Trick Room denial options. Uh, you could you could realistically go in DD Rillaboom into a Trick Room Palkia. But that, for one, really relies on knowing ahead of time that they have Trick Room. Like, let's take the Susage team. Um... That one could very reasonably have Trick Room over Protect on the Palkia, but you never know. So if you dedicate Ndidi Rillaboom into that Palkia lead, and you go 100% in on, I'm going to click the Helping Hand, Max Drum Soul, I'm going to remove their Palkia turn one, and they Dynamax and click Max Wormwind, it's a really, I'm pretty sure it's just an insta-lose position. Because right. they then have an Amoongus, which can click a free spore. You have a minus one Rillaboom and a, sl and a Sleep and DD. And th that's pretty hard to come back from. So I feel like this team especially excels versus other hyper offense teams from this IC. Like, um, just in general, I feel like the. Uh, Let's take the uh, Hirofumi team. I played. I didn't play Hirofumi, but I played somebody using the same team during the IC. And I was able to just bear skew to right through them. They had Porygon 2 for Trick Room, but they brought it in the back, which made it insanely easy. Because by the time Porygon came in, I already had Rain back up. I had a Max Fish and Zacian in back waiting to come in and deal damage. And so... Stuff like that tends to be super easy to go through if you know your lines correctly. Because a lot of the times it's leading uh, Barrascuta Kyogre and immediately switching out Kyogre. Because Kyogre is obviously the win condition in the late game. And that's what I feel like this team excels best in. It's either blowing things up turn one with Airstream plus Water Spout or conserving Kyogre for the end game in order to come in once everything has damage on it and clicking Choice Scarf Water Spell. Yep. Uh, I mean, that was uh, the same line as a lot of Seismito teams did. But like you said, Max Strike, I think, adds another dynamic to that because mm -hmm. if they do KO Barrascuta after it gets an attack off, now you get your Kyogre in. Everything's slow and damaged, and that's just a crazy position to be in. Exactly. That, that was by far one of my favorite things. Um, just because it does add another level of depth. It's... Uh, well, I don't have to click Airstream. I can very easily strike them, lower their speed, and it does a similar effect, but it's on them this time rather than being on me having to keep my Kyogre in. 
which I feel right. like is another one of the problems with stuff like Kingdra. They can't really viably run stuff like Max Strike or Max Darkness, and Barrascuta can run both of those very well. And so, were there any notable matchups during your IC run that you wanted to talk about? Um, so, one of the notable matchups that I already touched on was the I played the Hirofumi team. Um, I was very much able to sweep through them with just my hyper offense options. Um, because especially against a team like that, where they have the bulkier options with the eerie impulse foul play P2 or the bulky SD citrus berry grout on, uh, those tend to fold pretty fast if you can keep pressure on them and they're not able to say, get a trick room up or get some spit F boosts going. So that one I felt was very notable. Um, one, one of my biggest losses was to that pretty standard, um, that pretty standard, uh, Grimmsnarl, Dialga, Zacian, Ditto, Core. It's been running around lately. It, it had a really big week in MPA. Um, one of my losses was to that because Gr Grimmsnarl, Dialga is really hard to get through with this team. You can deny fake out and the priority moves from Grimmsnarl with your Ndidi, but you're not really able to damage the Dialga very well. And I think that's something that desperately needs to be addressed if I'm going to refine this team in the future, where it needs to have a better Dialga matchup. Um, <laughs> what the... So I mentioned two of my losses were to that, very, that exact build, the Dialga, Grimmsnarl, uh, Ditto or Shifu, Rillaboom. Uh, I'm blanking on the last Pokemon. but um, Two of my losses were to that exact matchup. And then the third one was actually to a Zacian Kyogre, Whimsicott, Thunderous Incarnate, Kartana, and Incineroar. And what ended up happening there was they led Whimsicott, Kartana. And keep in mind, this is a Zacian Ogre team. They led Whimsicott, Kartana. I led Barrascuta, Kyogre. They clicked Sunny Day turn one with their <laughs> <laughs> And I was just like, oh, I do not have answers to this. <laughs> and so, like, all props to them. They, they, they have the tech move for the mirror matchup. <laughs> the Zacian Ogre mirror. But that, that very much caught me off guard. And I lost very quickly after that turn one. That's wild. You gotta love the IC. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that player actually ended up doing decently well. Uh, Tio translated their name to Orange, and I think I saw in the standings that they finished like 18, 20 or something like that. So definitely not within Japan Nats qualifying range, but they did pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, one of my biggest regrets for this IC was that I timed it very poorly on my end. On day one, I played 11 games because I got home from work at 8.30. The IC had started at 7. I took an hour and a half. I chilled. I relaxed. I unwound after work, and then I started playing. And I ended up being up at like 2 a.m., realizing I had to go to work the next day. <laughs> and after 11 games, I was just like, okay, I'm done. So I only played 11 of my 15 on day one. And then on day two, um, I only played uh, 12 games. I went 12 and zero on day two. And so currently I'm 22 and one, but I'm currently missing seven of my games that I could have done. And then on the third day, um, I wanted to do some other stuff. I was just chilling. This was on Saturday now. Um, I wanted to chill and I knew I had to work all day Sunday. So I only played five more games, uh, sorry, seven more games of my 45. And I ended up finishing 27 and three. So I only played 30 of my 45 games. And if I could go back, I would have played a lot more because I really did want to do like one of those top 30 teams that they post on Liberty Note. But I yeah. just didn't have the time for it, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, you definitely, with with that record, you definitely could have kept pushing for uh, one of those top slots. 
And so that's a really good bridge to another topic that I think we should cover is that uh, the March 2020, March 2022, excuse me, uh, March 2022 International Challenge has been announced and it is the first event that gives championship points in two years now, if not more, uh, which is really exciting. Um, and I know a lot of people are gearing up to play in that. So my personal philosophy for these tournaments, if I'm tr trying to do as well as possible, is to play my games as late as possible because it means that um, the players who normally would, you know, after 12 games be at 1550, after, you know, 35 games might be at like 1700. And so I'm just getting more points for playing the same players. That's my personal philosophy, uh, which is why I try to play as many games on Sunday as possible. But uh, obviously you have a lot more recent success in these ICs. Do you have any advice for people who are trying to do well in March? Um, what, what are the ideas? So obviously there's the very common idea of play all 45 games on Sunday if you can, because you're getting points from these other players. Um, one of the ideas that I actually saw coming around from one of my friends, uh, one of the Japanese players that won one of the ICs last year, um, they actually played 10 games on day one. And they proceeded to play the remaining 35 on Sunday. And I think the logic behind that was you can get a couple of easy wins to start off the tournament by just farming these players who may not be trying their best, you know, the rookie D players. Um, and then come Sunday, once you already have your start, you can start actually farming some more points. I, I think that's an okay strategy. Um, personal, personally, it, always comes down to what your schedule is like i work on sundays so i knew i couldn't play on sunday so i right. had to play earlier in the tournament but um i think the most optimal way to do it is to play all 45 games on sunday but to space them out throughout the day right i mean that's the other thing is like i can't i don't have the endurance to play 45 games of pokemon in one day so even though ideally i do that um that's not always feasible yeah. my other like micro optimization um because you know we're vgc players we optimize evs we spend hours figuring out ev spreads we can figure out how to play the ic optimally um my other micro optimization is to start playing my uh day one games when people are starting out their day two games so right after the reset because yeah. again then there's a little bit of ladder inflation with people you're playing as people who have played who are playing their 16th and 17th games while you're playing your first games mm -hmm. um, so that's my other strategy is try to play as people are starting their uh, their second or third set of games. Um, so just like another thing to think about as you're getting into it, but uh, yeah. at the end of the day, it just comes down to how many games you win. So uh, that's the, really the main focus, I guess. Well, yeah, there's um anecdotal story about playing games on day one. Um, I have a friend, his name's uh, Helios. Day one, he didn't play a single player above 1500 rating for his first 12 games. <laughs> So he was 12 and zero and he was like 1580 mm -hmm. and it was honestly just such a shock because while we, it, it, while we understood why he was at that point, we were more shocked in the form of, wow, he has gotten 12 players in the 1400s in a row. And that's a very real risk that you can take playing day one. Right. So I guess those are all the questions that I have. Uh, do you have any final words or shout outs that you wanted to give? Um, I want to give shout outs to the samurai. Uh, we're going to beat the puppies this week for MPA. That's for sure. No shot. Um, yeah. Yeah. Real shot, man. Who Gavin's about to go crazy. We'll see about that. We'll see. I've got, I've got the spice cooked up for him. Okay. Okay. I like it. Um, and then I want to say thanks to Helios, Toast, and Crystal Ninetales. They were in call with me, and they were watching my games. They weren't really ghosting because none of them actually cared about the IC. None of them cared to play Pokemon. But they were just, like, making fun of me the whole time and keeping it light. And I think that's something you really have to do when you're playing this many games. Keep it fun. Because mm -hmm. if you're just stressing throughout the entire tournament, it's going to be really hard. So I, I want to say thanks to them for keeping it fun, you know, just making fun of me a little bit, making fun of my opponents a little bit. Um, yeah, I think that. And then uh, thanks to you for having me on the channel. Yeah, of course. Uh, I appreciate you coming on the channel to, to share this team again. Really cool team. Um, and couldn't, I, like I said, I say this, I feel like I say this every time, but I really couldn't 
do this without people like you who are willing to come and share your ideas and uh, really explain exactly how to use these teams because I learned so much from it. I improve as a player and I know that, you know, everyone watching uh, really appreciates you coming on as well. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Honestly, I was very excited to do this. Yeah. Uh, well, if you want to try out this team, of course, the paste is in the description and uh, the rental is on screen right now. Uh, definitely recommend you try this out. Uh, and continue to improve upon this like Beriscuta version of uh, Kyogreization because I really do think it has a lot of potential even moving forward. And yeah, again, thank you so much for coming on. And until next time, I will see you all later. Have fun.